Hello? This is he. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll be right there. I'm here to pick up Alden Call. Did you fill this form out? We'll notify you of a court date within 30 days. Dad, I know I messed up and I'm sorry. Come on, bud. Let's get you home. Uh, we are concluding our brief series on joy uh, this morning. And, and so I hope in some way talking about joy has been useful to you. Uh, if it's not been useful to you, I can tell you it's been useful to me because I need those kinds of reminders, and I suspect many of us do, and so I hope it's been useful. Uh, but I want to share a quote from Tom Newberry as we begin setting up what we want to talk about today as we think about defending our joy and so he said this, he wrote, throughout this third section of the book, my objective has been to help you become more intentional with your inputs, the things you allow into your heart. And bear in mind what we're talking about today, we're talking about defending our joy, which, which assumes that we already have taken possession of it. I can't defend something I don't yet have, and so we're assuming that we already have possession of it, and... and so the question is, what might I be allowing in every day uh, that, that, that is going to potentially compromise my ability to walk in joy? Now, uh, a lot of you heard me say, and I'm going to set it up this way today, but you've heard me talk about it. At one point for me, it was simply way too much political news. Uh, living over in Atlanta, uh, our, my office there, I had one of those little bitty clock radios and you'd tune it on AM and some days the reception was great and some days the reception wasn't so great. Uh, but there was a guy, a local guy in Atlanta, he had a morning talk show and then I'd listen to a national talk show. And in the afternoon there was an Atlanta guy that just talked about stuff going on in Atlanta. And, and over time what I began to realize is that playing in the back of my mind was this constant tension and this constant irritation. And it was, you know, even if it wasn't what I was directly thinking about, it was just already there. And then finally, one day, I finally realized, even if the people who would tend to lead the way you think government ought to be led, even if they're leading, there is no audience growing value in talking about what's going right, right? I mean, if you want to grow an audience, you've got to keep the tension stirred up. You've got to keep talking about things that are still wrong. And in a country like ours where uh, so much more Jesus is needed, there, there's always going to be something wrong. And so finally, I turned it off. And, and, and even... Um, you know, today I, I probably have allowed the pendulum to swing too far the other direction. That always tends to happen. If you reach an extreme and you start trying to correct, happens in a lot of different contexts, you end up overcorrecting. And, and so today I'm probably uninformed, more so than I ought to be. But I'm okay with that for a couple of reasons. One, if I need to get caught up, I think it's a lot like tuning in a soap opera you haven't watched in 10 years. Okay, here's what I think I could do. I could turn days of our lives on this next week, watch about two episodes, and I think it'd be just like 30 years ago when we watched it every day. I, I think I could catch back up uh, because politically things, ne the ideological arguments never change. They're always the same. And so the other reason I'm okay with being underinformed, I think it allows me to focus more on areas where I can actually make a positive difference and my effectiveness in those areas will increase when my joy is intact. And so as we think about, and it may be something different for you, you know, but whatever it is, we need to not have our joy compromised. And so uh, these strategies we want to talk about this morning, they're biblical uh, the strategies for defending our joy. He says, number one, take responsibility for your personal firewall. Now, if you're a car person and you hear firewall, one of the first things you think about is that, that, that panel in between the engine compartment and the passenger compartment. Car fires are rare. Uh, they always cause a great scene when one occurs. Uh, but, but what you hope is if something goes wrong within the engine compartment, that firewall allows you time to get out of the car. That's what you hope. 
Now, for most of us, computers are a part of our day-to-day -day lives, and so when you start thinking about firewall, uh, you're thinking about protection from a different kind of danger. Hackers are out there. Uh, they want to steal from you. The, the, the firewall on your computer, it's there to protect you, but there is a similarity related to being robbed by a computer hacker and being robbed of your joy. Generally, the hacker needs some help from you uh, in order to succeed. He needs you to click on this or maybe respond to that or provide just a little bit too much information. The hacker usually needs your help and similarly, the, the, our adversary, the one who wants to steal our joy, and, and sometimes we can blame that on people, but every time uh, we're, our, our walk with God is being compromised in any way, uh, credit ultimately goes to, to Satan himself, the devil himself, the one who wants us, he wants to own us, he wants to uh, have us, he wants to take us away from God, and so I've got to take responsibility, and so do you. And so Sam read the verse just a minute ago out of Proverbs chapter 24. It says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. I can't guard your heart for you. You cannot guard your heart for me, my heart for me. I love what Newberry says. He says, As a child of God, you are called to be a faithful steward of your thought life, God calls you to keep yourself pure, not to fill your mind with things that go against his law and desires. And he shares Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, second part of that verse, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining the bright lights or shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. And I, and I mentioned this previously in the series, and I'm going to come back to it a couple of times today. It's a big deal because we normally associate self-control and living a clean life with our actions. If I can avoid doing the wrong thing, then I'm living a clean life. And what we've got to do is transition this over to the idea that it all begins with the way I think. When I don't think the way God wants me to think, then eventually I'll act in a way God doesn't want me to act. And so it's the idea that there's software in our minds that we're trying to protect. And yet, even though that's the case, and even though it's biblical that we are to guard our hearts above all else, how often do we allow negative ideas? people's opinions, things like that to compromise our joy. Because in Philippians, Paul is laying out this clear game plan to the kinds of things that we ought to be thinking about. Stan led us in a reading of Philippians 4 verse 8 as we began this morning. We read that again together. We've got to think of that as a firewall type verse because it's instructing us to focus on things that God wants us to focus on, focus on things that are consistent with a joy-filled life. And I love what Newberry says. He says it's a, it, it is a challenge, but if you and I could not accomplish it, he would not have suggested it. And see, I'd modify his quote there because we're talking about Scripture. It's not a suggestion. Paul, by inspiration, is saying this is the way you need to live. And so me taking responsibility for my thought life, it will protect, it will facilitate, it will grow my joy. And so how do you do that? Well, he talks about a couple of habits. I'm going to run through these very quickly. And I love the fact that he uses the word habit because doing the right thing one time, protecting my joy one day, that's a great win, but I've got to turn it into a habit. And he says, habit number one, feed yourself with positive mental nutrition. And so again, not to belabor it, but inputs matter. Not every uh, input can be controlled. There are things that come to us, through us, at us all day long. Can't control everything that comes past us, but the, the Bible does instruct us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we take every thought and make it captive to Christ. And so I don't have to latch on to all of those things that are that are sinful, that are negative, that would compromise my joy. The question is, is it a big enough deal to warrant us putting in the work to control inputs? The second habit, and we've talked about this earlier on, this is a review, he says, make sure that joy is bookends on your day. 
He says, begin the day with joy. I believe your potential for joy, he says, begins with daily quiet time. And then he talks about morning momentum questions. What could I read, watch, or listen to during the first 15 minutes I'm awake? What should I avoid listening, watching, uh, reading during those first 15 minutes? How could I prepare myself to be successful the night before? What could I tell myself the instant I wake up every morning? What should I avoid telling myself the instant I wake up every morning? How could I intensify my gratitude in the first 15? How could I use prayer and scripture to get this done? Great questions. And then he says, and end the day with joy. Approach the last 15 minutes of your day very much like you do the first 15. He says, remember what gets impressed in your heart gets expressed in your circumstances. And so the bottom line question is your habit, is my habit to end our day in a manner that's supportive of being joyful. He says this regarding arguments, fights, disagreements. He says the absolute worst time to be negative, to be discouraged, to argue, to deal with junk is right before bedtime. And see, we can probably all identify with that because we've all done that and we realize how it just does not work. And, and the Bible, it's biblical not to do that. Ephesians 4 verse 26, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. Why? For anger gives a foothold to the devil. And so he closes the chapter about how his personal goal is, is, is he prays for discernment regarding what he watches to, what he watches, what he listens to on a consistent basis. And, and that's a really good thing for all of us. We should plead with God for him to give us wisdom regarding the inputs that we allow. But then second, he says you need to make every effort. If you want to defend your joy, make every effort to junk-proof your mind. Now, I think a word about junk-proofing is in order here. I say I want to eat right. But if you come over to the house and you open the pantry and you look in there and then you open the refrigerator and you look in there and you open the freezer and you look in there, you're probably going to swing around to me and say, are you sure your goal is really to eat right? Because you would see a lot of things in the pantry, the refrigerator, and the freezer that are not consistent with what I just said. Sometimes we say we want to live a certain way, but we haven't really done the work to get the things away from us that we need to get away from us. And so here are some of his suggestions regarding junk-proofing our minds. He says, number one, be selective about who you invite into your inner circle. So the, the value of right relationships, you cannot underemphasize that. If you want to have a healthy mind that produces joy, uh, we've said it from to the kids from the old time they're old enough to understand it's far easier for someone to pull you down than it is for you to lift others up. And sometimes we'll do that object lesson. We'll put a chair on the stage and we'll have a, we'll have a big kid in the chair, a little kid on the floor. That little kid can pull the big kid out of the chair because it's always easier to pull somebody down than it is to lift others up. And the thing that he points out is interesting. He says, every relationship... Every relationship will be doing one of those two things. No relationships are neutral. The relationships you have with people, that person's either lifting you up or that person's either in the process of pulling you down. And remember, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, bad company corrupts good behavior. And so we always have read that, or I have, bad company corrupts good character, you know, through the years you read that and you think, well, that, that, you know, the, the wrong people around me, again, has the power to get me to do things I ought not do, fall into sin, whatever it may be. But I've probably not given that passage its due related to the idea that those who are close to me will affect the way I think. Proverbs 27, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. That sharpening, that refining, that influence from your inner circle of friends, it'll occur whether they are helping you or harming you. Those who are close to me, they will affect me. 
That's what this verse is about, the impact that close friends have. That's why being selective matters. He notes there, he, Newberry says, you will inevitably take on the habits, attitudes, beliefs, and even the mannerisms of the people you surround yourself with. And then he says, if you hang around with people who have no real vision or who limit God with their own caustic attitudes, you'll eventually become just like them. Now, everyone we encounter, if there's a way we can minister to them, we need to be Jesus to them. That, that's what we've been called to do, but we've got to minister without allowing that person to have a position of influence in our lives. Maybe his most astute comment is this, because I believe it's very true when you stop and think about it. He says, people do not punch, kick, or drag you off course. If that were the case, you would fight back and protect yourself. Rather, they nudge you just a little bit, then a little bit more, then a hair more, until you are finally pulled right off the stage or whatever it is that you're on. It's gradual. And so some things we ought to think about related to building an inner circle. People in my inner circle, their character and integrity ought to be equal to or greater than mine. They avoid gossip. They share your faith. Or even better, when you think about them, it, it seems to you that they're further along in their relationship with God than you are. Their lives demonstrate the joy-filled fruit of their faith. You'd like your children to grow up to be similar to them. They hold you accountable and, and ask you the tough questions that are avoided by the majority. Do you have people in your inner circle that will hold you accountable? They draw the best out of you and remind you that God is doing exciting things through you, through His church. They're sincerely committed to being positively sharpened by their exposure to you. And just remember this. If you think about your inner circle today and you're like, my inner circle doesn't look like that at all, it's okay. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to do it in an unchristian-like way, but it's okay to begin rebuilding your inner circle in a way that will actually allow you to protect your joy. Uh, the second idea is memorize and personalize Scripture. Now, this is, this is the preacher saying this. It was kind of maybe ironic to you, but this is an opportunity for me. Memorization, probably not a strong suit. All the way back to college days in tax class, I hated having to memorize little aspects of tax law because you're sitting in class and they're going to test you on this and you're like, but when I go to work, it's going to be in the software. I don't have to know this because the software will know it for me. I hated memorization. But when you think about memorizing scripture obviously the best way to know scripture it comes from having spent so much time with a certain passage that you just have embraced the verse even if you don't know it word for word you know where it is and you know essentially what it says you can always have your hands on it but he also reminds us of a, a, an important principle and why this matters related to junk proofing your mind. He says, your conscious mind can only hold one thought at a time, positive or negative. The only way to eliminate a negative or counterproductive thought is to replace it with a positive, empowering thought. And then he says, your greatest asset is God working in you and through you, and this is best accomplished by allowing God's Word to abide in you. I can't allow God to control my life if I do not know what God expects of me. It just will not work. I've got to know what's in His Word if I expect His Word to bless my life. Also a word about personalizing, because he says memorize and personalize. And I'm going to use Philippians 1, verse 14 and verse 15 as an example. Verse 14, Philippians 1. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Now, what would that sound like if I personalized that verse? I, Philip Goad, am doing everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize me. It's almost laughable. 
See, it's almost laughable. When I, and there are, there are people in this room, some of you can call foul on that because you've heard me complain. You, you know that I don't always get this one right. When you put your own name in it, it almost becomes laughable. It reminds us we have work to do. Uh, the second verse, verse 15, I, Philip Goat, am living a clean, innocent life that allows me to shine like a bright light in a world full of crooked and perverse people. When you put your name in there, maybe it becomes a better goal passage because the more often we get it right, the more often we can be living the way God wants us to live. And so memorize and personalize Scripture. Number three, affirm God's goodness. He says to affirm God's goodness means to declare with conviction the goodness, the abundance, uh, and joy that God has promised His children. Think about it this way. The things we say out loud have a lot to do uh, with, with where we are regarding whether God is actually good. Now, we sing it, God is so good. We love that song. We sing it, but do we affirm that in other areas of our life? Because Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is talking there, and he reminds his audience that we are responsible for the things that we say. He says there in verse 35, a good pr person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. And so to affirm the goodness of God, to affirm, simply means to build up, to reinforce that that I want in my life. Newberry points out that since we're, we're always thinking, we're always affirming something. There, there are things where I may never say them out loud, but my thoughts are either affirming how good God is or they're not. And so what am I affirming? This is the worst. This is the best. Uh, this always happens to me. Think about it this way. If Jesus were physically standing in the flesh next to you, after all, God the Spirit is in you. But if Jesus is standing next to you, would you affirm, would you say out loud this, this, the same kinds of things that you sometimes say on a daily basis? Because Jesus might be tempted to turn and say, you know, I, I died for you, I saved you, and now you want to talk about that? You're hung up on that? You want to talk about how bad that is? Come on, man. I mean, he might just call us out. And so the author's suggestion is refuse to say anything that is unbecoming of a child of God. And what we want to do is work on not thinking things that are not becoming as children of God. And then number four, quarantine negativity. Now, we began by talking about the importance of taking responsibility for that personal firewall. And so we kind of come full circle right here. Computer software that, that serves as that firewall, it performs this important service. When it finds things that ought not be there, it'll grab them, and you'll often get a report that says, these are the things I've quarantined away from you. Now, you can decide if you want to actually destroy it all. Quarantine, we understand it in a more personal way than ever before because of COVID, but quarantine is about isolation. And so for the negativity in our lives, for all the stuff that would rob us of our joy, it, it, how do we quarantine that? How do we make sure that stuff gets away from us, that it stays in isolation? Because he knows negativity has a tendency to spread like a virus from person to person and then in one area of life to the next. Uh, uh, home's negative and all of a sudden my work life's negative. It just has a way of spreading. And so how do we isolate that? Well, here's his suggestion, and it's okay if you want to laugh. He says the best way to do this is to schedule your negativity. Now, that sounds strange, may even sound silly, maybe laughable, and I think he understands how crazy it sounds because he has to, he has to start explaining this. He says, why schedule it? When you take the spontaneity out of being negative, you drastically weaken the emotional energy it contains. And that's a good thing. He also says, when you schedule it, the problem that you want to be negative about, by the time you get around, to, it's time to actually dwell on that and be negative about that, a lot of times that problem has gone away, it's shrunk in size, it's not nearly what it was. And, and so that waiting can also be a good thing for that reason. He says, if your issue is chronic worry, 
Schedule a time each week to sit down and worry. Don't give it free reign to ruin every waking hour of every day. Well, that makes sense. He says, further, married life, family life, you can schedule a weekly or daily issue time to deal with gripes, disappointments, unmet expectations. It's almost like having a staff meeting at home. But he says, you know, whatever your reaction is, because this is all, you know, you're like, well, this is just out there. But I love what he says. He says, you'll notice that this scheduling negativity is very hard to do. But then he says, you'll notice how a little progress goes a long way. And his analogy is you can be a C student with this quarantine negativity thing and you'll be very pleased with the results. In the end, if we intend to effectively defend our joy, it's imperative that we remember the crucial role of gratitude in a joy-filled life. We think about gratitude during the fall, but it needs to be an everyday thing with us, and you know that. You think about it. Every saved person should stand out as an exceptionally grateful person. Paul, in, in Philippians 4 that we've been focused on, he instructed the, the, the folks there. He said, thank God for all that he's done, Philippians 4, verse 6. We should give thanks that he designed us to be joyful. We should give thanks to God that he loves us enough to want to save us. We should thank God, be grateful to God that he is saving us. Newberry concludes, a healthy mind produces joy like a healthy body produces energy. It agrees with God's promises and a healthy, disciplined mind craves direction, growth, and challenge. The last interim work I did before I came back to preach at North Highlands and to work with the congregation here was down in Meridian, Mississippi. And I wasn't with them long. I, I started helping them out in the fall of 2019 and then finished up a couple of weeks before I got back here uh, in March of 2020. But one of the men, one of the members there, Ralph Hubbard, uh, we would have a closing prayer. And, and the, the room wasn't as big as this and the church wasn't as big as this. But the opening prayer the, or the closing prayer would be said, the amen would be said, and then before anybody could rustle around and start making noise, Ralph would kind of yell out for the whole church to hear, remember your joy. Don't leave here today without your joy. Take your joy with you. And because this was Ralph's closing thing that he said every week, everybody at church had one of these mugs. Now, it's just a cheap mug, and it's, a very, it's an even cheaper sticker on it. It's just a handwritten word, joy. I was honored when they presented me with one. Everybody had a mug to remind them of their joy. And so that's a great way to leave the service every week. During COVID, Ralph had been out doing some yard work, and he came in, and I, as I understand it, he collapsed in the shower, and Ralph has gone on to be with Jesus, and I certainly hope that somebody down at the Meridian Church has carried on that great habit of reminding the church to be joyful. Because with God's help, we can successfully defend the joy that he's given us, that he designed us to have. And so the question is, are you walking in joy today? Because never should there be a day when you walk into this building to worship God, to be with your church family, that you do not walk out of here with your joy intact. If, if, if that's going on, then, then we need to serve you better. There's something that needs to be done differently. We ought to never leave home without it on any day either because as we walk out the door to face the world every day, we should constantly have in mind, I'm a child of God. I've been saved from my sin. I've got work to do in the kingdom. I'm supposed to shine as a bright light in a world full of darkness. That is the job that God has given me to do. We should never leave home without our joy. We've got to stay focused on Philippians 4 verse 8. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. If we can serve you today by helping you refocus and recapture your joy, we would love to do that. If you're outside of Christ today, if you've not been immersed for your sins, I've said it before during this series and I'll say it again now, you will never find joy outside of Christ. Joy, true joy, is only found in Christ. And so if we can help you with that, putting him on in obedience today, we'd love to do that. But maybe the life just has a way of messing things up. And if our shepherds can pray with you and for you, we'd love 
for them to do that today. You can respond publicly. You can find one of them privately. If you're online and you have a need, you can let us know, and we'll, we'll serve you in whatever way you need uh, help as well. But if we can help you today, please let it be known while we stand and while we sing.